Very good. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alafia Abami from Queen Knowledge Africa. Uh, it brings so much pleasure to invite you to our webinar and would love to get things started. I would like to appreciate everyone that has been that is ready here and I would like to introduce Dr. Ellen Chuma Okoro to start our session. Dr. Ellen Chuma Okoro is a, is a Nigerian copyright lawyer and she's the research fellow at the Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies, where she is an associate professor. So with a clapping ovation, wherever we are, you don't have to unmute our mic. Let's avoid, let's invite Dr. Ellen to begin our session on open sharing under the Nigerian Copyright Act of 2022. Dr. Ellen, you can unmute and speak. Welcome. Thank you very much, Alafia. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know where you are watching from, but it is a privilege for me to be here with you to have this conversation. And I want to thank um, Alafia and his organization, Open um, Knowledge Africa, for considering me worthy to join you to share knowledge and information about a topic, especially from the Nigerian context. So it's important because um, in two ways, um, when we talk about open sharing, we're talking about the internet, sharing on the internet, and it affects everybody. And it can affect you in two ways either um, by way of benefiting you, so using the internet to your advantage in terms of um, visibility for your work and other opportunities, or it could also affect you in terms of stepping on landmines um, in, and encountering some kind of repercussions in terms of copyright infringement. So if you are not careful how you um, work with the internet, how you interact with, the, uh, with content in the internet, it's possible that you could commit some offenses that have some repercussions. So um, on that basis, um, I think it's important that uh, we look at the top, the subjects, both from the Nigerian perspective, that, that's uh, talking about how Nigerian law provides for it, and also to look at the international um, um, landscape, how other countries provide for it. So I'm not going to talk too much deeply about the subject, just to give you general information, which if you're interested, you can also guide you in terms of um, trying to find out more about and trying to ensure that you protect yourself while the internet and also gain value from the internet. So, um, So I'm just trying to get to my slides. This, this slide okay. is being shared now. Yes, I know. So I'm just going going back to that interface. Okay, so um we I look at this topic, I I, I look at I, I have provided a kind of general outline which is going to guide the conversation and not necessarily that I will, I, there can also be some deviations as we proceed. And please, if at any point you feel like you need to inter, you need to jump in with a comment, it is also welcome. So um, for us to have a proper understanding, I think we should also on, talk generally about what copyright means and what it does not mean. I know most of us have basic knowledge about it, but since this is going to be and online content, it's also important that we, we still try to define what we are talking about for the benefit of those that might not have such knowledge. So I also look at um, um, the relationship between copyright and open sharing. So there seems to be some kind of paradox here. You're talking about copyright, which talks mostly about exclusivity. And you're also talking about um, open sharing. So where's the connection? Is there some kind of antithesis in this subject, is there some kind of conflict? We want to look at that. And then I'll also talk about the copyright-related challenges to open sharing. 
how how copyright can actually um inhibit open sharing. So um I will, I also briefly talk about arguments in support of open sharing and also now with this general background, I will now go to freedom of panorama, which is some kind of um some kind of standard for sharing of certain kinds of content online, particularly images. So we'll look at that, we'll look at meaning of um, freedom of panorama. In, in, because of the, in order not to bite my tongue, I'll rather stick to the acronym, which I just um, said, FOP. So we'll look at FOP, we'll look at the meaning, we'll look at the rationale for it, and we we'll look at different standards and implications for such differences. So why why is it necessary to be careful when you're dealing with uh, images online? Because countries provide for them differently. And so what you know about one country is not what you know about the other country. And so it makes it necessary that you really have a clear understanding of what law applies to that particular image that you're trying to use. So like I said, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relationship of how you can use, um, how you can create works from um, from some kind of content that are copyrighted and basically buildings and um, other um, three-dimensional um, creative works. So how you can create derivative works from them by ways of photographing. And also, apart from the fact that you can create directly, we're also concerned about how you can use some of those images that people on, up, upload online, people have already taken those images, they upload them online. You can fall into trouble by using them, even though you're not the one that took the picture, but you can actually find yourself in trouble if you use them inappropriately. So that was about it. And then we, we now focus on Nigeria. We look at the Nigeria, the new act really, which has some interesting revelations and we, we want to ask some questions. Why, why, why would it, um the law take that dimension and so on so that's um, basically about the outline that i'm going to follow so uh, generally copyright is, is a legal concept or you can call it policy strategy which protects works and in this context like i said we are talking mostly about online content and such works are they're diverse um, a category of such works you have them in literary form you have them in drama in music and some other kind of artistic works like paintings, sculptures, um, architectural, architectural designs, and things like that. So um, copyright protects such works. And it, it does not only protect the original creation of that work. It also protects the derivative of that work. So people can use a particular um, content to create other content. For instance, people can use a, a novel to, to produce a movie out of a novel. People can translate a novel to other languages. Um, and then in the particular context that we are even talking about, people can snap pictures of buildings. And so those photographs become derivative works of those buildings. So the question is, why is copyright even necessary in protecting these works? So many, many theories exist, and it's not something that I want to delve into here, but we can only say that there are two um, dimensions. Copyright protects, um, uh, it's mainly from the surface of it, you 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 will say uh, one will say that copyright is designed to protect the interests of work owners, people that own those works, and it's believed that they are entitled to those protection in the form of exclusive rights, so that they can gain some compensation in in, in cases where infringement occurs, uh, when people use their work without um, permission or illegally, they can gain some kind of reward, remuneration. And it is believed that that will encourage people the more to be creative. But at the bottom of this, um, um, on the surface objective, there is an, a, a, another objective, which is even more important. Copyright is more concerned to uh, ensure that there is enough work in circulation for the public to use. And so copyright is particular about sharing. It is not interested in just protecting the works of owners per se, but it's more interested in ensuring that those works circulate um, in the society so that people can use them creatively, um, 
in very beneficial ways, in ways that add value and are beneficial to the public. And so it's not so it 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 does not care that the owners of the works have created the works, but it cares more about the fact that they are able to ensure that the public can benefit from those works. So, but that now, how does it do it? It does this by creating those exclusive rights. And those rights, how do they operate? They operate by making, giving the owners of those works very exclusive powers to prevent people from sharing their work. And they can even, they can sometimes they can refuse permission for such sharing. And then when anybody shares those work without their permission, it becomes an infringement. And so then why would you even be talking about those that kind of powerful right given to the owners of works? And on the other side, copyright is concerned with sharing. Yes, copyright is concerned with sharing because it believes that if you don't share knowledge, you don't share ideas, they will not thrive. The best way that ideas, knowledge, and information thrive is by sharing. If you don't keep them, if you keep them to yourself, of what benefit is it to you? But if you share it to the public, it becomes the kind of the, the raw material from which the, the other creative works can can um, can flourish. And so there has to be a mechanism for copyright law to balance these two um, related but somehow conflicting objectives. There has to be some kind of mechanism that copyright law we use to balance. And how does it, um, how is that done? It does this by, on the one hand, through the use of licenses or permits. So uh, owners of um, copyright works are empowered. They have the power, they have the privilege of granting permissions for their works. So on that side, it's a kind of affirmative power given to the owners. But on the other side too, it provides for exceptions and limitations. So even though owners have the power to control some parts of their work, they don't, they, they, they are not allowed to exercise that power absolutely. There are some exceptions, there are some circumstances under which they will not exercise that those powers. So whatever um, protection that copyright gives to them, there are some circumstances that it will not reach. So by the use of these exceptions and limitations now, Copyright is able to balance the, the, the both objectives of ensuring that owners of works are protected and also on the other hand of ensuring that there is open share, there is sharing of works. So if for instance, um, a particular exception exists for a, for, a, for a work, for instance, there is an exception for use for educational purposes. And so ordinarily, if you reproduce a novel for commercial purposes, the owner has the right to be, um, to require permission, to require you to get permission from him. And he can give that permission by licenses. But if you're going to use that novel for educational purposes, non-commercial educational purposes, then you don't even need to call back to the owner to ask for permission. You just go ahead and do it. And the law allows you. Ordinarily, the owner of that, the author of that novel has the power to deny you permission. But because the law has created an exception based on the fact that you want to use it for non-commercial educational purpose, you can go ahead and bypass the author and use the work the way you want to use it. And it will not count, it will not empower the author to take any legal action against you. So that's how one of the ways that um, the, the law tries to balance this um, to right. Then the law also provides safeguards in the, um, in the form of the public domain. So any work that is falling into the public domain, huh? irrespective of whether it was um, copyrighted initially when it was created, it can no longer be protected. And in the public domain, you don't only have works that have expired, whose term, the copyright term has expired. You also have works that from the very beginning, they were not copyrightable. Or, um, the law will not allow such works to be copyrighted. For instance, works that 
they feel it doesn't satisfy the criteria for um, copyright, such as it's not creative enough and things like that. So a lot of those works. So copyright ensures that it's, it's carved in such a way that no matter what, once that a work has fallen into, into, into the public domain, then the power of the author to control the use of that work expires. And like I said, it also does so with the use of exceptions and limitations. So that's how the law is crafted. It is not really about um, anti-sharing or um, creating hurdles to sharing of information or content. Rather, it's designed to promote sharing. And when we talk about open sharing, what are we talking about? I'm sure uh, most of us here, are, I can assume, or I can presume that we all know what we're talking about. But for the benefits of doubt, open sharing is basically free sharing, sharing to the public without requiring the consent of the copyright owner and without infringing the law by such an action. So that's what open sharing. And open sharing is largely connected to the internet. It became a conversation when the internet emerged. Before the internet, open sharing was basically irrelevant. There was no place to be talking about open sharing because they were traditional, uh, measures and also um, inherent qualities in the in the way um, copyright works were created, which made sharing something that you can just take for granted. For instance, you could walk into somebody's library, pick up the person's book, and read the book, and borrow it without infringing copyright. That was in the old dispensation, in the analog era, but in, in the digital era, even the very act of you opening that book constitutes infringement because it's reproduct te technically it's reproduction. So open when we talk about open sharing, we are limited mostly to works that are circulated online on the internet. And so yeah, there, are, there are very sound arguments for, for open sharing. Why are people so concerned about open sharing? Because when we talk about open sharing, it, it, cuts, it cuts across a, a, a diverse um, category of movements. You, you have open access, you have um, access to knowledge, you have um, copy left, you have um, creative commons licenses. So it's a really broad spectrum of movements and ideologies. So why are we even talking about all this? Because information by itself, is it, it needs to be democratized. Like I said, you keeping information to yourself, what, what does it profit you? It's like, it, it reminds me of the idiom of a dog in a manger. A dog in a manger would, uh, the, probably the dog will not allow the, the, the goats sharing the manger with it to eat the grass there, to keep backing. And at the same time, the dog cannot even eat the grass. So what's the point? It's like keeping something that you don't, you may not need, or even if you need it, not as much as others, and you're just keeping it because you don't want others to use it to enjoy it. Not that you need it. So it makes it it makes the use of the it, it undermines the value of knowledge. It 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 makes knowledge not to be optimized. The value of knowledge not to be optimized. Like I said, knowledge is seen as the reservoir, the the raw material for. Um, or other um, newer creativity. So if you don't allow knowledge to um, diffuse, to move, then society will not benefit. And so it allows for democratization of knowledge. So uh, is a strong advocacy, is a strong um, objective of copyright. But unfortunately, we find out that there are um, barriers in the law that can sometimes inhibit open sharing. And those are the barriers I mentioned earlier, like allowing or expecting the work owner and author to grant licenses. Whereas sometimes those licenses may not, getting that permission may not be feasible for several reasons, either because of the disposition of the author towards granting it or the author is not even, um, you're not even able to locate the author or even to determine who actually is the author. So those can create barriers and that is where the, the law comes in now. So the law is actually designed to encourage sharing, but sharing must be done in a way that will also benefit the work owner. 
So that's the main purpose of um, the copyright and the relationship between copyright and, um, and open sharing. So now that takes me to freedom of, um, next slide, please. Are you still hearing me? Yes, ma'am. The next slide is the uh, freedom of panorama. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, so now that takes me to freedom of uh, panorama, which I said FOP. Again, I, I want to assume that it, most of us here understand what we mean by freedom of panorama. But again, we'll just give a basic explanation of it. I want to look at the legal status of the kind of contents that are affected by this freedom. What are the kind of content? And what's the background behind it? We want to also look at the arguments for and against freedom of panorama because there is a huge debate going on between work owners, artists, especially especially photographers and, and so on. There's a huge debate going on between them and the public, especially the open culture movement people. So on one hand, some people say there should be very a robust freedom of panorama. But on the other hand, the artists are saying that no, that should not be allowed. And every, each of these the, um, perspectives have their very strong arguments. So we'll, we'll, we'll take a, a, a brief look at that. Then we'll also look at the implications for the different standards. Because if you look at the law, from a global perspective, there is no uniform standard for, especially when you want to talk about things like what kind of works are covered by freedom of um, um, panorama or what kind of uses are permitted for those works or even the meaning of public uh, place because freedom of panorama is basically concerned about some kind of um, works that are mounted in public spaces. So even the meaning of public space is debatable. Countries have different understandings and this can create a kind of spaghetti bowl um, outlook in terms of trying to determine how or whether a particular you using a particular image online is legit or it will land you into trouble. So then we'll narrow down to um, the provisions under the Nigerian, under the new Nigerian um, Copyright Act. So um, if when trying to understand the kind of works covered by um, freedom of panorama, I think the best reference would be the Ben Convention. The Ben Convention is the mother, is the grandparent of most of the laws, copyright laws that we have to be both national and international. So the best reference, and it states um, very, very clearly, it states that literary and artistic works shall include drawings, paintings, architecture, sculpture, engraving, and lithography. So those, if you look at them, the kind of works that I mentioned here, they fall into a specific class. They fall into a specific class. But again, they are classified differently in, in different jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions might separate them. They have architectural works different and then um, um, other works like um, the, the other works like sculpture, which they will classify as visual arts. Some will use the broad classification of um, artistic craftsmanship. In the US, they use the classification of useful articles. So you, even at that, there is there is a kind there is a, a bit of confusion or not really confusion if you're looking at it from the national perspective there's no confusion each country has a standard and the Ben Convention actually allows that but if you want to look at it from the global perspective perspective for instance uh, um, somebody like me in Nigeria trying to use an image online probably of the of um, the any iconic image abroad. So then I'll be asking questions and those questions become very important. They are not something that you can just shift aside. You have to really deal with those uh, questions. So these are things that make 
some of these classification definitions important. Now, the Ben Convention also provides that any sound or visual recording shall be considered as a reproduction under copyright. So in terms of all these cl um, classes of works that it has itemized as um, literary and artistic works, it also provides that making any visual recording of those works is a, a, a reproduction. And as we know in copyright, reproduction is an exclusive right of the owner of the work. So it means that for you to make those any of those visual recordings, you need the permission of the owner. And visual recordings, as we also know, covers a number of activities, including photo, photographs, videos, paintings, drawings, and things like that. So we can see now that um, 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 the Ben Convention even lays the legal foundation for the contemplation of the freedom of panorama um, standards. So now imagine if an individual takes a photo of any of these um, copyright works, so, such as um, any public building. Maybe we'll talk about the National Stadium, for instance, and somebody takes, or you know how some people erect uh, sculptures along the road, some very interesting creative works like that along the road. I think in Lagos here, there is one um, like opposite um, Seven Up, there is one very, um, very artistic or very rich and creative collection of sculptors that have been mounted opposite um, Seven Up. So if one takes ordinarily, going by the definition of the Ben Convention, it says this kind of works are copyright works and making a reproduction of them is, 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 is covered by copyright. So if somebody randomly goes there and take a picture of those sculptures, for instance, or the public, any public building in countries, public buildings would be important in countries where architectural designs or architectural works are protected. So even though it's a public building, somebody designed it, somebody built it. So that person has the copyright over there. So if you, somebody randomly goes there and take a picture, the, the question that will we'll be, we'll be asked is, does it constitute an infringement? Does that single, single act of going there to take a picture or a video of that image, does it constitute an infringement one? And if the person goes ahead to upload it on the internet, on his, his or her social media page, is that also an infringement? And even moving forth, um, further, for even moving further, if another person sees the image, likes it, and downloads it to use it, is that an infringement for that other person? So those are the questions. And those are the questions that the freedom of um, information standards try to deal with. And the answer will depend on what the law of that country says about the freedom, the, the status of freedom of um, panorama. What does the law say? Does it protect it? Does it restrict it? So freedom of the concept or the whole understanding is said to have originated in Germany to allow taking images of work of arts and architecture. And um, it was um, due to the Germany at that time had very rigid copyright laws, which restricted taking of this picture. So there was need to carve out a special legislation that would allow photographers to take um, pictures of public buildings and so on freely without inhibitions, without being concerned about whether they're doing something right or wrong. And so that's how that special legislation was created in, in uh, Germany. And since then, it has moved around the world. So it, it, it refers to copyright. I mean, freedom of uh, panorama in copyright refers to legal standards. Um, and these legal standards are designed in such a way that they permit people to use images of copyright or protected works. What is that ordinarily they enjoy copyright? And how do they enjoy copyright? Because they satisfy all the conditions for the grant of a copyright. For instance, they are original, they are creative, and so some other, they, they are fixed, and some other uh, qualifications like that. So ordinarily they enjoy copyright, but freedom of um, panorama allows or it permits using these images in some ways that ordinarily will be considered as an infringement. But again, like I said, the standard depends on the country, whether the country 
law will allow you to look at it as a infringement or whether it is not. And this, there are qualities for identifying such works. They have to be publicly placed and they have to be permanent. So it's not something that you just go and put somewhere and then move away, move it away after some time. It has to be permanent. And um, in some countries like the UK, they have defined permanence to mean that by nature, the work will be permanent. So by nature means the lifespan of the work. So at no time that the life, the work is, the, the lifespan of the work or that the work is still standing, at no time will it be removed. And it was never the intention of the person that put it there, that at some time, point in time, he or she will remove the work. So there has to be that element of permanency. And so that is, it now points to some certain kind of works like buildings, like some structures, like some statues. Some, in some countries, they have bridges, you have towers, you have um, London, so things like London Bridge, the, the what's it called? There's um statute, the Statute of Liberty in um in the US. You have the you have the this um I've forgotten what this image is called, this image of the risen Christ in, in Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil. So the, in, it's not only about buildings, it's also about some statutes, it's also about some structures like bridges, like towers and things like that. So it gives you an idea of the kind of work. And another thing that we should, what I would like to also underscore is that the works that are affected by the FOP, they are not in the public domain. Those works are not public domain work. Once they are public domain work, like I said, copyright doesn't care about them. It's free. So they are not, the, the copyright in those works is still subsist. So you cannot go and look at the Liberty um, Tower, for instance, you say it's a, it's a work in the public domain because it's mounted in a public space. No, copyright, it still enjoys copyright. As far as the person, if, if the law allows the person that created it or designed it to claim copyright. So that's an important distinction. And such works uh, um, can be, Derivatives can be created from such works in many forms. And these forms include photo making, um, taking photographs of them, videoing them, and paintings and drawings, which I mentioned earlier. And it doesn't stop there, also publishing them to the public. So you could take, again, that's an, an important distinction. You can, sometimes you could take pictures, some laws will provide that. You could take pictures of those images, but the important thing is, what do you want to do with those images? So for instance, you could take them for your own personal use. You just want to put them in your, in your, in your personal collection or as a, as a, some, I'd say, a memo, in your memoirs and things like that. But you don't want to, pub, um, to publish them to the public. So if you just take them and leave them, probably use your phone, your mobile device or any other device to capture the, the pictures and you just keep them there. It, it will not constitute an infringement because the law contains enough exceptions to allow you to do that. But once you try now to share it, to upload it on the internet, it now becomes a problem because you are, you're, you're communicating the work to the public now, you're distributing the work and th those are rights that are reserved for the owners specifically. And for you to die, you need to get the permission of the owner. So what are the arguments? So, um, well, we, we could say at this point, we could say that there's an underlining conflict somewhere. Okay, so why, why, why should we allow this kind of freedom? Sometimes, even for commercial purposes, why, 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 is it, why are people even arguing for freedom of uh, panorama? So there are people that argue for, and there are people that argue against it. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lafia, sorry, do I, do I have time limits? The session is to spawn for an hour 30 minutes. We are 47 minutes in now. Uh, well, this is 12.45, okay? Yeah, yes, I'm almost, yes. so, yeah. almost done. We are 45 minutes in. Yeah. So what are the arguments? Again, the, the society is very important in this debate. The interest of the society is very, the interest of the public. So one of the sound arguments for FOP is that 
it is to accommodate the interests of the larger society. So apart from the single person, the individual that created that work, the public are interested in it in many ways. Some people want to, just want to stand there and pose for their picture as a background. Some people want to show it to other people. Some people want to use it for research. Some people want to use it, different reasons. So the society has a larger interest, which goes beyond the individual interest. And then it's also rooted in the notion that if, if you take the pain of going to a public space to, um, to um, erect an artistic work, a very creative, beautiful work, and um, you expect that people will enjoy the aesthetic, the beautiful nature of the, the creative nature of the work. You expect people will en enjoy it. You expect that maybe people will even be educated by it and enriched by it. Then why would you even complain when people come now to reproduce it? To, I mean, it's like promoting your own objective because you want to use it for beyond that space. They want to use it for other reasons. So it's like, um, enhancing the value of the work. So why would you complain? You are the person that went there in the first place to erect it in the public. So why would you even complain? So that's the question the pro FOP people will be asking. And then they also um, say that it's a, it's a very easy way and free way of uh, people to express themselves and to also share their experiences. So when you take pictures, people express themselves through those images. If I go, for instance, uh, to a particular um, background and take a picture, I, it means I have, I'm lured towards that kind of beauty, towards that kind of attractiveness. So it's a kind of expressing my own preferences, my own um, uh, understanding of culture and things like that. Then there also there is a way of even preserving memories so even for future generations, because sometimes this um um this um these structures might be destroyed. For instance, when, when uh, during the Syria war, a lot of iconic sites were destroyed. So if people don't take these pictures and preserve them, future generations will not even have knowledge of this thing. So it's a way of even preserving um a culture for future generations. Mm -hmm. And this argument was um one of the the, the arguments of the of Germany when the EU was considering um, they were trying they considering abolishing freedom of um, panorama they were trying to uh, uh, they were debating about establishing stronger rules against freedom of panorama and so they had this debate still in that um, context they, they 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 also argued that it serves the cultural educational other interests of the society but not only that it also protects the interest of the author and sometimes cultural heritage. And how does it protect the interest of the author? Especially when it allows for remuneration. So the author had this um, desire to also express himself in public, to showcase his skills. He went to the public and did it, but he, he, didn't, he did not do it with the anticipation that it will work against him. So sometimes when people come and take his work and benefit from it commercially, maybe make money out of it. The, the person that erected that particular um, structure might feel, uh, might not be happy about that, might feel cheated. So, but where you have standards that allow remuneration, for instance, you can, you can make the images, you can distribute them, you can use them for whatever purpose that you want to use, including commercial purpose, but you must um, provide adequate remuneration for the, the person that created the work. So in that context, it also protects the interests of the author. And then it also protects cultural heritage because some laws will actually provide for freedom of um, uh, panorama, but they'll also go ahead to tell you how you can use the work. They'll, they'll create some restrictions that you, the work cannot be, images cannot be used for social and so purposes. So for that, in that way, they also, help to protect the cultural heritage. And then one of the very, very important arguments is that when you, um, when you allow restrictions, you create challenges, you create multiple problems for people because how people, random people will be required to be asking very complicated questions that they never understand. 
what is um, licenses, what is copyright. They might not even understand. Random people, they will have to be challenged to be asking questions that it is beyond their understanding. And above all, it will even stifle professional photography in public places because that is a profession on its own. And the, the some of those um, um, aesthetic image um, structures in public is their raw material for their creativity. So if you do that, it will stifle that particular profession. And also it will ruin people's daily leisure, maybe tourism and things like that. Because a lot of questions, how will people even sort, how, sometimes how will people even know that um, a particular use is commercial or it's not um, com commercial, um, that a particular law prohibits commercial, uh, commercial use. How would they know what, what constitutes commercial use under a particular law? So it creates, it creates problems for people, additional problems, which they argue that the easiest way to do away with those pro pro problems is just to allow freedom of uh, panorama. Now, the people that argue against it, they say, no, 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 that they don't agree. There are restrictions against FOP are in compliance with the laws of the country because it's, you, the laws does not allow misappropriation. You should not misappropriate somebody else's effort. You must pay for it, more compensation. So it's it's actually in line with the laws of the country. And and of course they say it's just like receiving royalties for other works. For instance, you play somebody's music, you pay royalties. So why wouldn't you extend that to another form of creativity in the public space? So it's, it's just doing the same thing, but in a different subject matter. And they also say that um, using free shooting of such works in public places, especially for commercial purposes, conflicts with normal exploitation of the rights of the artist. So like I said, artists, people might go to the public space and erect those works, but with just the intention to please the public. But when they know that somebody has used it to, get to profitably, especially making huge money, like some people that might use it for uh, to advertise for these major companies that they might use it for advertisement purposes and so on. So, and then they, they realize that people have made money out of their effort without them benefiting. So it's, um, it's against um, um, fairness, which is one of the other very strong rationales for copyright protection. And they say it's unfair for artists who produce works for um, public, um, display and they they receive very low income in terms of commissions compared to what some people might make out of using images of those work. So it's very, very unfair for them. And this could undermine what the fundamental, one of the fundamental objectives of um, copyright, which I mentioned earlier, that it is sharing. It can undermine it because people will no longer be interested in sharing their work. They will not be interested in going to the public to make those images. And so it's, it, it stifles that uh, objective of sharing, which is fundamental to public uh, copyright in the first place. And it could also uh, discourage the display of cultural works, traditional works. Imagine you have a, a particular um, traditional image, which is revered by a particular culture. And it, it means it has spiritual meaning for them, deep meaning for them. And you find people maybe coming to um, kind of desecrate the place by inappropriate acts, committing inappropriate acts in the place or using the image, associating the image with something, things that are not really proper. For instance, I remember one of the cases in um, Australia um, where um, a particular image, which is revered by the indigenous community in Australia was used to as uh, designs to design carpets by a very top, um, uh, what do I call it? Very top um, designer. He used that image to design carpets, and the people, the indigenous community, went to court because they said it's so derogatory for their knowledge because carpet is something people step on. This is something they revered. This is something that means has deep meaning from there. Are you going to put it on the floor? And people will be stepping on it. So, and they want the case, of course. So, if you don't have some kind of control, it will affect that. So, um, um, please, can I? Okay, am I on to the next slide? Can I see the next slide, please? No, the next one. Okay. 
okay, before before then, we we talk, have to talk about the differences because, like, um, remember I said there are different standards, and there, there are implications for these standards for these differences, uh, because it might if you don't understand the you have to keep track of the position in other countries. If you don't do that, you might actually find yourself infringing copyright. So there are different standards. Uh, one of the differences lies in what types of works are subject to FOP. So some countries will say it's only buildings. Some countries will say it also covers um, visual art. Some countries will say it, it, it covers, you know, even something different. Some will say it covers two-dimensional works like paintings. So there, there is not there is no standard as to what kind of works are um, protected uh, or enjoy the freedom. And you can, if you look at the different jurisdictions, you will find these differences. Even within the European Union, you will find these differences. And then before you even start crossing um, over to other jurisdictions. Now, the uses too, what kind of uses? There are also great differences. And that also um, impacts on the, the the limits or the scope of the freedom, whether it is limited or unlimited. So the more the uses, the more flexible the freedom is. So some states allow any use of images obtained within the framework of um, FOP without requiring the permit of the owner, even for commercial purposes. So it's like when you have a broad spectrum, this is the very, very un um, unlimited one. So they allow all kinds of uses for whether commercial, whether um, um, non-commercial, whether you're providing remuneration or you're not providing remuneration, it doesn't matter. As far as it's located in a public space and properly so defined, then um, the freedom applies. So some was, uh, you can also make the distinction between those that insist on non-commercial purposes only and those that insist on uh, both non-commercial and commercial purposes. For instance, um, in countries like Latvia, some European um, EU countries, for instance, they 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 they, they are limited to non-commercial uses only. They don't allow commercial uses. Once commercial use is um, involved, there are some additional rules that will apply. For instance, you might need to pay remuneration, so it's no longer like free like that. Then there's also the distinction between using for commercial use and requiring to pay remuneration or using without requiring to pay remuneration. Again, if you look at across countries, you have this, you see the differences that apply in different countries. So, um, so again, you, you even apart from all these other different standards, there are some countries that even say that have no, you could say they don't have any freedom of panorama because it's so limited in scope that it's almost irrelevant. So you can even say it, it doesn't exist. For instance, in, in Italy and Greece, they permit free reproduction and communication of images, of such images only for, um, the mass media. So that's very limited. So you could express that there's no freedom of panorama in those countries. The same thing with South Africa. It's very limited. South Africa um, restricted to only um, cinematograph films or television broadcasts. And it defines those uh, services in a very specific way. So in such countries, we can as well say that they don't have any um, freedom of panorama. So the other just, um, standard that is not uniform is, like I said, public space. What constitutes public space? Some countries will say public space is only outdoor. But some countries will say, no, public space include indoor spaces like museums. So there are different standards and all those things apply in how the, how the scope or how the freedom of panorama applies the standard, whether it's allowed or it's not allowed. Uh, yeah, so, um, okay, now, so having said this, uh, we now quickly look at the Nigerian um, copyright. Uh, remember I said this information is important both for you as um, as a 
or like a public citizen of today's internet driven world because you also have to understand how other countries apply freedom of uh, panorama while you're using images online uh, as well it's important for you to also benefit to create or to utilize the opportunities that the law allows by freedom of panorama so we now look at um, nigeria what does nigeria say uh, interestingly uh the I would say Nigeria falls into the category of the no, no freedom. And this is a huge deviation from the old dispensation because the old dispensation was almost limited. I think it's, uh, I, if I can just read it out, the, or under the old law, the law said the right conferred in respect of a war by section five of this act does not include the right to control the reproduction and distribution of copies of any, any artistic work permanently situated in a place where it can be viewed by the public. So it's um it's not even about out space. The, this old dispensation also includes indoor spaces. So for instance, if you have um, um, music, like national museum or places where you pay money to go and enjoy the services, that's, that's some museums that uh, pay money. Okay, they, they, they require um, fees for you to enter and view their content and everything. So you could even say that that one was also um, falls within the kind of works that are protected. So it's not only about buildings and other physical structures or um, three-dimensional works that are situated outside. Even as long as the public can access the interior of the building, to view works that are inside, located, um, located inside, it, it, it's also covered. So this was really very, very elastic. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around this to understand why I think there must be a very serious argument why the new dispensation took the, the route that it took by section 20 sub 1E, when they provided that um, freedom of information is restricted to the inclusion in an audiovisual work or a broadcast of an artistic work situated in a place where it can be viewed by the public, but with no mention of photographs or three um, D works or some other kind of works that can be considered as um, uh, works that are covered by um, FOP in other jurisdictions. It limited. It, it's limited to only broadcast and and or of an artistic work so it's very it's just like saying the, the the case of limiting it only to the mass media you could as well argue that there's no freedom of uh, panorama in nigeria and that's very very well in in, in, in the if we look at all the arguments that we are, i've mentioned earlier about the people um for freedom of panorama then you begin to apply to Nigeria, and then we see the consequences of such a restricted provision of the FOP. And what this means is that if you're using any image in Nigeria, from Nigeria, you have to be really careful. You have to be really careful because if somebody decides to take up action, there could actually be strong legal basis for that. Please, can I have the next slide? So for us to even understand how restricted Nigeria's uh, position, let's look. Uh, let us look at what the UK says. Uh, I would say, and that's my own opinion, that um, the UK has one of the most elastic, uh, most permissive standards. For for the UK, it covers all buildings as well as most three dimensional works such as sculptures that are permanently situated in a place. Remember, I said in a place in a public space which is outdoor as well as in premises, which are open to the public. So it's both outdoor, I, it, it covers almost all three dimensional works. If you look at the provisions critically, it's very, very permissive. It has been established that open, uh, the UK courts have actually established that open to the public is broader than public's place. So if, uh, if another national jurisdiction limits permiss permissive acts to only structures that are erected in public space, and the UK says not only public spaces, but also spaces that are open to the public, even though they are indoors, then you see that it's really, really broad. It's really, really broad. Then we look at the US. The US 
high position is not as broad as the UK. The US protects um, architectural works, which are mostly limited to buildings or structures like bridges and uh, towers. And it also protects um, some form of um, works, what we call useful articles. Now it protects them. So it protects them. It guarantees all these um, rights that are guaranteed to a, the, the creator of the work or the person that created the work, that designed the work. The person has copyright owner of that work. The person has this exclusive right of distribution, public display and everything. So by the UK, by the US position, these particular rights don't apply as long as um, buildings are concerned. But the UK, the US position doesn't cover other artistic works protected by copyright, including some kinds of sculptures. So it's limited to the kind of sculptures that it applies to. It's not all kinds of sculpture, sculptural works that it applies to. So using such images, for commercial purposes may become a problem for anybody. So those are some of the things that, um, um, so it's really doubtful. Again, I say it's really doubtful why Nigeria will take that position, this very, very limited position, because globally the trend is towards a more relaxed um, freedom of panorama um, um, standard. And even recently, as recently as 2016, the EU was made an attempt to strengthen their their restrictions against image making images of public buildings, and it was denied. I mean, the debates the they couldn't resolve the situation with both arguments, so they decided to maintain the status quo. So it's really doubtful why Nigeria would take this uh, position. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, next slide. I've talked about US, sorry. Now, yeah. So in conclusion, I will say that um, um, copyright is designed to enable sharing because sharing benefits the, pop, the society. It is not anti-sharing, it's pro-sharing. But the, the question is, how do you share so that the law is just about sharing in such a way that the the interest of the owner is not uh, compromised. So it reconciles the, the, the two concerns of the owner's interest and also the public interest through the use of licenses, which are the tools that the owner uses, and also exceptions and limitations, which are the tools that the public uses. So one of such provisions is the FOP, which sets standards on how people can take images of certain works and how they can use them. Now, different standards are, exist, like I said, across countries. And it's very important to be careful when using images online, because you might just be using a, a an unlawful image and that might land you into trouble. So the Nigerian Act adopts a very limited standard and it's, it's, really, um, it's really not clear why that is so. Um, so, especially when we go by global trends, where there is a greater movement towards uh, freedom of panorama. Now, um, and if we don't understand these um, standards properly, we might just find ourselves in trouble when we are using images online. So thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, Mo. I'm sure everyone would have some questions. I'm sure most persons will have some questions and I would like to give them for, for individuals and participants to, to, to ask their questions. So if you have a question, you can unmute your mic. You can raise your hand, unmute. I'll give you permission, then you will speak or you would just write in the chat. So, Ma, thank you so much. I didn't, I didn't even know the Nigerian, the Nigerian law has actually restricted freedom of panorama to just audiovisuals only. So, while we are waiting for people to ask questions or possibly raise their hands, 
I'll I'll love to ask that. What what do you think uh the advocates of the open movements like Free Knowledge Africa as an organization can do to encourage the Nigerian Senate to expand or to return it to the status quo. I, I, I'm talking about uh, freedom of panorama. Like, what do you think open source and open uh, open movement advocates can do to encourage governments to to expand freedom of panorama? And please let us ask our questions if we have any. Okay, let me I'll I think, just can I answer them as we go? Yes. I think you should just answer them. We don't have any questions for now. Okay. No one is raising their hand. Okay. So um I think the starting point is to understand why. The okay. basis of change. That's okay. because I just I just I never I didn't know too. You know, we are still studying the the ads. It was in the course of researching this topic that I, I discovered the information. So I'm also curious as to why. So that would be the starting point. When so if you if you if one can understand why, then one can now begin to present debate, arguments as to why it shouldn't be. And then the next step is to do a lot of advocacy, a lot of um, enlightenment and involvement in the law making process by being a, a, a part of the activities of the uh, legislature okay. in terms of holding the debates in the hand in on the floor. And also, you know, even as a private citizen, you can initiate a bill. Okay. So when you, before you initiate a bill, you have to understand the, uh, the, the facts of the case. You have to present your arguments very well. You have to articulate the problem and you, you have to articulate the solution. So it requires you to understand the background first. Why was even why was the old act more expansive than the new one? What was the reason for that? And then your arguments you present why the necessity, the importance of freedom of panorama, global trends, and things like that. So with that, you can also initiate a private member bill for amendment. Okay. Thank you, Ma. Uh, another question is, I just want you to talk uh, briefly on the discrepancy between the old copyright generally. I know the new copyright act of 2020 still focuses on, uh, on creative works on social media, skits and all of that. Like, I'll just love you to just address it and the new, the new, the new laws, the new tenants being introduced. As 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 compared to the two thousand and four act. Well, number one is that the law is, is it targets digital um, copyright. Okay. It's about digital copyright. So that again, that on its own is a huge, um, is a huge change and a huge a, a huge uh, progress because it takes Nigeria away from the old law, which was more focused on the analog era into the digital era. And as we know, the digital era has a lot of issues coming up. And even as we are talking about freedom of um, panorama, one of the very important additions in the new act is the, is the provisions on, um, what do you call them? Internet service providers and intermediaries, which allows them to take down infringing content, take down notices and things like that and the considerations that they have to take them um, that they have to consider in order to take action so it provides robustly on how um isps can be very relevant in the regulation of um, copyright infringement because they have the power over the infrastructure which the law might not the reach so the other one is the provisions on technological protection measures um, so it recognizes that copyright today has different layers of protection apart from the law, which is like the first layer of protection. You now have the technology, which is the second layer. People use, use technology now 
by creating um, um, gate passes, like creating um, digital locks to their content. So that's the second layer. Then you have the third layer, which now protects those technological measures because people tend to bypass those measures. For instance, people can hack into your system, bypass your password and things like that. So the third um, defensive layer for copyright is to, for the law to provide some legal support for those technological measures. And so the law introduced what they call anti-circumvention provisions. And what does those provisions do? They, pen they penalize people that bypass those um, digital barriers. For instance, people that hack into people's accounts, people that break into illegally um, access people's um, social media pages and things like that, they can be prosecuted under the provisions of those anti-circumvention provision measures. So they, those measures are basically there to protect the technology that the industry has introduced as the further protection for their content beyond what law cannot achieve. Law can provide that, okay, if you, if you, um, if you infringe my copyright or if you um, copy my work illegally, maybe download my work Ill illegally, you have um, committed an offense. Yeah, fine, but I have to take an action. I have to go to court, I have to win the case. So the industry now, in order to um, stay, uh, do a catch up work with the hackers, they now develop these technological measures. So for instance, you, if I pass, password my account, you cannot go and illegally download contents from my page and things like that. So now then the, the anti circumvention measures now came in to protect those technological measures. So that those, those are two key important that are relevant to the topic we are discussing. But of course, there are several other provisions which we can we can only take them piecemeal. Wow. Thank you so much, Ma. Uh, we appreciate you for joining us. I Thank don't you. think there's any more question. No, no, like you did a good job. No, nobody had. I, I, Nobody has question except myself. So thank it's you, like... everyone. Okay, Musola, you didn't raise up your hand. That was why I didn't notice. Oh, sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Ma, for the wonderful presentation. Though my question is a bit away from the freedom of panorama. It's on the public domain. They talked a bit on it. So um, we know that the public domain contains materials that are free of copyright or intellectual intellectual property restrictions. And government publications are some of those materials that are in the public domain. But what now happens when we see some materials that are published by governments or by ministries on some arms of the government, which now have copyright restrictions or copyright assigned to that ministry or that organization. And the contents of those materials are not like um, secretive or confidential information. Now, for the case of use or reuse, what does one do in such situation when you find a material that is copyrighted, though published by a governmental institution? Well, um, a lot of times, um, copyright frowns against um, um, what would I call often like um, excessive appropriation or misappropriation. You can take, you can make, make use of a particular content, but when you make use of it in excess to the extent that it becomes something that has, a, has some kind of distaste to it, then even if that work is free, it um, it raises questions. So, um, if using um, content published on in um, by government um, institutions, and again, it depends. I don't think um, publications like articles and things that are published by government institutions would be the law allows them to be so free that you can just. Um, how do I say it? You can just reproduce them verbatim without some kind of uh, acknowledgement or um, attribution. Remember, copyright is a broad field. It doesn't only protect the economic rights, it also protects moral rights. 
So at least you have to, even if the, those works are free, there, there are some moral rights are standard like attribution. So you will not want to take those works verbatim without attribution. But I don't think if you reproduce them and at, with proper attribution, then you can it can be provided that they fall under works that are allowed or considered in the public domain, uh, according to the law, provided they fall under those categories. I don't think using them in that way will, um, using them in that way without proper attribution, I don't think it will be allowed under any circumstance. Hello, is that hello? Musala, does she answer your question? Has she answered your question? Yes, yes, that answers the question. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, we we have another uh, two questions in the chat box, in the chat rather. One for my Otunde Ogundari. I believe she is a she. With the restriction of FOP, that is freedom of panorama in Nigeria and the surge of AI images, that is artificial intelligence, a artificial intelligence images, if by prompt, artificial intelligence, use, uh, intelligence uses data on the web to generate an image that is seemingly de derivative to a work in public space, in public space, how will that be addressed? You see, that's interesting because even as I think yesterday, on Tuesday and Wednesday, or Wednesday and Thursday, um, I can't remember, WIPO was having a session on AI. And the question, generative AI, and the question is, it is still an evolving question. There are questions and questions, but there are no answers yet. There mm -hmm. are no answers. And one of the controversial areas is the information that is used, the data that is used to train AI. Who owns that data? How do you account for that data? So, but the thing that happens, they have what they call stock data. So when, for the data miners, a lot of times they use stock data to train AI. They also depend a lot on public domain data. But now the question is, which is what both legal and policy experts are trying to answer. If you have used them, um, you have relied so much on the benefits of public domain and use data from public domain to train AI. And now you want to commercialize that knowledge. So they're trying to look, they say there's a gap somewhere that AI, um, the data that is used to train AI, somebody must pay for it. And even if you source it from the public domain, you must, there must be some kind of remuneration that goes back to the public domain to support the public domain. But all I'll tell you is that, honestly, I can't give you a definite answer because those policy, people, the white people and everything, they were all sitting there, scholars, they were trying to, they are still debating on AI. And as we are talking about one aspect, it's already moving into the next um, level. They were talking about AI before, today they're talking about generative AI. AI that you just need to train it and leave it. It doesn't need for that data on its own to start working almost um, with almost near human intelligence. So, they are moving. So the, the question, my, my dear, I can't answer question on AI because it's still, <laughs> but there, there are interesting questions coming up. Very, very interesting. And I'll urge everyone to follow that debate because as we speak, Niger um, Africa has not keyed into that debate and is a problem. Conversation. Okay. Watch out and follow the debate. Okay. So I'll encourage all of us to. The, we, thank you, Ma. Thank you for, the, for that response. There's also a question from Anthony Okadia Pete, which, sorry if I mispronounced the name. Uh, the question is, what measures are in place for image protection rights in Nigeria? I don't understand the question. So do you understand the question? No? Image, image protection protection rights in Nigeria, what measures are in place? It's still, we still fall back to the law. What does the law say about image? images, how do you protect images? So we still fall back, are images, uh, are they considered um, um, copyrightable? Or are they not, are they not um, copyrightable? So it's still, 
provided under the law. Unfortunately, I haven't, like I said, this is a new act that we are all, I, I came across this distinction or this change in the current act because I had to research a bit on this topic. So most of the rights, are. If I was even thinking that maybe there should be a series somewhere looking at each of those rights individually. I've not really okay. looked at one of the law on image rights. Uh, that's just an honest, um, my honest response. I've not looked on the current provision on image rights in, in the act. Okay, ma, that is understood, ma. Thank you, ma. Is there any other question? Okay, in the absence of none, I'll be bringing this session to a close by thanking Dr. Ellen Shuma Okoro from the Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies for joining us and sharing a wealth of knowledge with us. I will believe in some subsequent months, we will have to bring you back and have some further conversations as it relates to the new copyright act. So thank you everyone also for joining us. We started about 12.10 and you've spent over 60, over 70 minutes of your day with us. Uh, we are Free Knowledge Africa. We are appreciative of your gesture. So we'll be expecting you in our next month's webinar. Till then, have a wonderful time. Bye. Thank you for having me. Yeah, bye, ma. Bye, everyone.